Welcome back to the channel everybody and if you're new to the channel welcome I hope you like what you see and what you hear what we got today is we have a couple more classic Sasquatch stories from J.W. Burns from the 1900s J.W. Burns spent many years as a teacher on the Chehalis Indian Reserve beside the Harrison River about 60 miles east of Vancouver British Columbia he wrote numerous articles and stories which were published in the Vancouver newspapers of the day now these stories occurred in the early 1900s is when he wrote them down. Now at first, the Native Americans on the reserve did not want to tell the stories because they were afraid of ridicule because according to them the white man never believed what they had to say. But after three years of plotting, he had come into possession of information more definite and authentic than has come to light at any previous time, he says. Disregarding rumor and hearsay, I have prevailed upon men who claim they had actual contact with these hairy giants, J.W. Burns says, to tell what they know about them. Their story is set down here in good faith. Peter Williams was a Native American who lived on the Chehalis Reserve. This is what J.W. says, I believe that he is a reliable as well as an intelligent Indian. He gave me the following thrilling account of his experience with these people. Now, before I get into his account, I'm going to go ahead and show you this area where all of this occurred and I pointed out to you really quick so you guys can go over this and see when I'm telling you the story you guys can picture these things happening in your own mind I believe it makes these stories better to be able to see these places while I'm telling you the story and you guys can picture it in your mind okay so this is the area guys where JW Burns is talking about right there's the Harrison River here's the Chehalis Reserve reservation I mean I should say and you guys can see right here is uh, the Chehalis Lake and the Chehalis River runs off of the Chehalis Lake there. So when he's talking about he saw what he thought was a bear that turned out to, a cre to be a creature, he's talking about right here on this river and it runs right next to this mountain that people call Sasquatch Mountain now right here. And another thing, so he took the canoe all the way back down to the Chehalis Reserve over this way. You guys can see the river right here. And then later on in the story where he's talking about that he was duck hunting, that's going to be right here, over here in this prairie, basically over in this area, right over in here. You guys can see. And later on, in the video I talk about another guy named Roy King he's going to be over here on this side of Harrison Lake and it's going to be here at Bear Creek where he talks about well I'm not going to ruin the story for you but this is the area right here where he's talking about where he has his encounter right here on Bear Creek and you guys can see it's pretty steep through there so keep that in mind when I tell you the story so I just wanted to show you guys these locations and I'll show them to you again during the story don't get me wrong don't worry about that I'll make sure I do that for you but I just wanted to once again show you these areas really quick so you guys know what I'm talking about when I give you guys the story okay now that I showed you those locations let me go ahead and get into the story Peter's encounter with the giant one evening in the month of May 20 years ago he said I was walking along the foot of the mountain about a mile from the Chehalis Reserve. I thought I heard a noise, something like a grunt nearby. Looking in the direction in which it came, I was startled to see what I took at first sight to be a huge bear crouched upon a boulder twenty or thirty feet away. I raised my rifle to shoot it, but as I did, the creature stood up and let out a piercing yell. It was a man, a giant no less than six and a half feet in height, more like seven feet, and covered with hair. He was in a rage and jumped from the bolter to the ground. I fled, but not before I felt his breath upon my cheek. I never ran so fast or since, through brush and undergrowth, towards the Statlu or Chehalis River, where my dugout was moored. From time to time, I looked back over my shoulder. The giant was fast overtaking me, a hundred feet separated us. 
Another look and the distance measured less than 50. I pushed my boat into the Chehalis and in a moment the dugout shot across the stream to the opposite bank. The swift river, however, did not in the least daunt the giant, for he began to wade it immediately. I arrived home almost worn out from running and I felt sick. Taking an anxious look around the house, I was relieved to find the wife and children inside. I bolted the door and barricaded it with everything in hand. Then with my rifle ready, I stood near the door and awaited his coming. Peter also added that if he had not been so much excited, he could have easily shot the giant when he began to wade the river. After an anxious waiting of 20 minutes, resumed the Indian, I heard a noise approaching like the trampling of a horse. I looked through a crack in the old wall. It was the giant. Darkness had not yet set in, and I had a good look at him. Except that he was covered with hair, and twice the bulk of an average man, there was nothing to distinguish him from the rest of us. He pushed against the wall of the old house with such force that it shook back and forth. The old cedar shook and timbers creaked and groaned so much under the strain that I was afraid it would fall down and kill us. I whispered to the old woman to take the children under the bed. Peter then pointed out what remained of the old house in which he lived in at the time, explaining that the giant treated it so roughly that it had to be abandoned the following winter. After prowling and grunting like an animal around the house, continued Peter, he went away. We were glad, for the children and the wife were uncomfortable under the old bedstead. Next morning, I found his tracks in the mud around the house, the biggest of either man or beast I had ever seen. The tracks measured 22 inches in length. The following winter, while shooting wild duck on that part of the Indian Reserve called the Prairie, which is on the north side of the Harrison River, and about two miles from the Chehalis village, Peter once more came face to face with the same hairy giant. The Indian ran for dear life, followed by the wild man, but after pursuing him for three or four hundred yards, the giant gave up the chase. Old village Indians, who called upon Peter to hear of his second encounter, nodded their heads sagely, shrugged their shoulders, and for some reason not quite clear, seemed not to wish the story to gain further publicity. On the afternoon of the same day, another Indian, by the name of Paul, was chased from the creek, where he was fishing for salmon, by the same individual. Paul was in a state of terror, for unlike Peter, he had no gun. A short distance from his shack, the giant Lee suddenly quit chasing him and walked off into the bush. Paul, exhausted from running, fell in the snow and had to be carried home by his mother and others of the family. The first and second time, went on Peter, I was all alone when I met this strange mountain creature. Then early in the spring of the following year, another man and myself were bear hunting near the place where I first met him. On this occasion, we ran into two of these giants. They were sitting on the ground. At first we thought they were old tree stumps, but when we were within fifty feet or so, they suddenly stood up and we came to an immediate stop. Both were nude. We were close enough to know that they were a man and a woman. The woman was the smaller of the two, but neither of them as big or fierce looking as the giant that chased me. We ran home, but they did not follow us. One morning, some few weeks after this, Peter and his wife were fishing in a canoe on the Harrison River near Harrison Bay. Paddling around a neck of land, they saw on the beach within a hundred feet of them the giant Peter had met the previous year. We stood for a long time looking at him, said the Indian, but he took no notice of us. That was the last time, concluded Peter, I ever saw him. Peter remarked that his father and a number of old Indians knew that wild men lived in caves in the mountains, had often seen them. He wished to make it clear that these creatures were in no way related to the Indians. He believed that there are a few of them living at present in the mountains near Agassi. We're going to go ahead and get into another story that he has written down. And without further ado, let's get into it. 
The Old Chief Broadcast. On May 23, 1938, a festival known as Indian Sasquatch Days was held at Harrison Hot Springs, British Columbia. Having obtained special permission from the Department of Indian Affairs at Ottawa, I took several hundred of my friends to the event. Unfortunately, in his opining speech over the radio, a very prominent official of the British Columbia government made a bad slip, thus offending all the Indians present who understood English. After a few preliminary remarks, this personage went on, Of course, the Sasquatch are merely legendary Indian monsters. No white man has ever seen one, and they do not exist today. In fact, thereupon his voice was drowned out by a great rustling of buckskin garments and the tinkling of ornamental bells as, in response to an indignant gesture from Old Chief Flying Eagle, more than 2,000 Indians rose to their feet in angry protest. Chief Flying Eagle then stalked across to the open space where the speaker stood, surrounded by important dignitaries and others. Absolutely ignoring the entire group, Chief Flying Eagle turned to the microphone and thundered in excellent English, The white speaker is wrong. To all who now hear I say, some white men have seen Sasquatch. Many Indians have seen them and spoken to them. Sasquatch is still around here. I have spoken. The chief then strode back to his place and signed to the other Indians to sit down, leaving behind him the government spokesman whose face was exceedingly red. I was one of the party gathered about the microphone and immediately said a few words over the loudspeakers to appease the angry Indians. I corroborated Chief Flying Eagle's statement that white men have seen Sasquatch, adding that although in sadly reduced numbers, Sasquatches are still believed to inhabit the vast mountain solitudes and unexplored British Columbia. During the many years I have been delving into this fascinating subject of the hairy giants of British Columbia, I have come into possession of much well-authenticated data. The oldest written record I have so far discovered is that of the late Alexander Colfield Anderson. He was a noted explorer and pioneer adventurer, and Colfield, a suburb of West Vancouver, is named after him. In the year 1846, then an inspector for the Hudson's Bay Company, Anderson was sent out by that company to establish a post in the then virgin wilderness in the vicinity of Harrison Lake. There was no doubt that he frequently encountered Sasquatches because he mentions the wild giants of the mountains several times in his official reports. For the most part, he writes, they were as wary as wild animals, but on one occasion, he and his party had to retire before a bombardment of rocks hurled by a number of Sasquatch entrenched on a hillside. Not until three years ago, however, did I actually meet and talk with a white man who's seen a Sasquatch with his own eyes. That man was a young mining engineer named Roy King. At first, Mr. King was reluctant to relate his experience, fearing ridicule. But after I convinced him of my own firm belief that hairy men still inhabit sections of British Columbia's wildest regions, he told me the following story. Some two weeks previously, entirely alone, he had been prospecting in the mountains adjacent to Harrison Lake. He had established his solitary camp beside a likely-looking creek that churned its turbulent way through rocky walls several hundred feet in height. One evening on his way back to camp, after a day of prospecting, he was walking along the top of one of the walls. As he came within view of his campsite, he looked down and was surprised to see something moving. Thinking that it was probably a thieving grizzly bear, King stopped and unslung both his rifle and binoculars. Focusing the powerful glasses, 
He was startled by the image they brought clear and close to his eyes. A giant of a man, entirely naked and excepting for a small space around the eyes, covered from head to foot with black fuzzy hair. The monster was interestingly examining the prospector's personal belongings. The young man admitted that at first he thought he had been too long alone in the wilderness and that he was seeing things. Then it slowly dawned upon him that through the glasses he was actually getting a close-up of the supposedly mythical Sasquatch. Thereupon he did the most sensible thing he could think of, stood perfectly stood and quiet watching through his binoculars until a few minutes later the giant strode off. Roy King then made his way slowly and cautiously down to his camp. He found that most of his possessions had been moved, but nothing had been taken away. Mr. King's story bears out what the majority of the Indians maintain, that the wild giants are neither belligerent nor thieves. On occasion, however, they will purloin food when hungry. Last fall, an Indian named Paul and his squaw were returning from a duck hunt carrying some half dozen waterfall they had bagged. Suddenly, a Sasquatch stepped quietly out of the thick bush on one side of the trail and stood directly in their path. Utterly terrified, Paul and his wife dropped the birds and took to their heels. Some time later, accompanied by other Indians, they cautiously returned to the spot but the Sasquatch had gone, and so had the ducks. Another Indian named Frank Dan, who asserts that he has seen the Sasquatch on many occasions, told me that one night, peering half hidden from a window, he watched a Sasquatch take two salmon from the branches of a small tree beside the house, where he had hung them up to keep fresh until morning. Again, on a Sunday about a year ago, when most of the natives were at church, a Sasquatch entered the village, and seeing that all was quiet and nobody apparently about, went into one of the houses. An Indian who had stopped at home saw the wild man come out burdened with loaves of bread and smoked salmon. So there you guys go, another J.W. Burns classic story or two. What do you guys think about these stories? Do you guys think that they are talking about Bigfoot Sasquatch creatures or do you think maybe this is like a uh, I don't know a wild tribe of Native Americans or something that are living in the mountains that are huge I would like you guys to leave me some comments and let me know what you guys think of these stories like I said these are the old classic ones from J.W. Burns a school teacher at the Chehalis Indian Reservation back in the uh, early 1900s and these stories are fascinating to me. I'm always fascinated by the older classical tales like this. So I give them more weight than I do the more recent encounters. That doesn't mean that they're true. That doesn't mean that they're not true. You guys make up your own minds on that. I just give you guys the info, read you the story, try to keep you entertained, and then you guys can you know make up your own minds on this. But like I said, I'd like to, you guys to leave me some comments. When you do leave me comments, if I respond and then you respond back, make sure you respond back with a totally separate comment so I'll get a notification for that. Because if you respond to my response, a lot of times I don't get it, guys. YouTube does not notify me on that. So the only way I'll find out is if I'm like literally going through comment by comment by comment and seeing if anybody else has responded to my response. And that takes up a lot of time. So it make it much easier for me if you would just comment a totally separate comment and that way I'll get that notification through my dashboard page and it'll make it easier for me to correspond back with you guys all right that's where we're gonna leave it make sure you guys all hit that like button for me share the video all over social media and always remember where there is a will star there is definitely a way and we'll talk to you guys later